Welcome again to another edition of the Southwest Climate Podcast. Mike, great to see you. Good to see you, Zach. Our hair is looking mighty fine, long (laughs) flowing hair. We're almost through it. And by by it, Mike, I mean this uh, very dry winter. Oh, yeah, that's right. Well, technically, yeah, spring what starts this weekend, the (laughs) astronomical spring. And uh, yeah, winter's starting to feel like it's over here in the in the southwest doesn't it of course there is that other thing we're hopefully coming on the other side of so uh, that has dominated our life and pretty soon maybe mike we can uh, be in the same same room and 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 record this looking forward to that yeah me too yeah we're what are we three months out from the monsoon season so we only yeah how many days how through. many days what's the countdown we need a countdown like you know there's like a doomsday clock there's right like, <laughs> what's our countdown to the monsoon i think i need to whip that up but 88 days 88 days. 88 days. Less than 90 days. Isn't that crazy? Can't wait. Can't yeah, wait. So we're, we've we're, got a little monsoon um, to talk about later, believe it or not. Uh, yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll drop that as a hint for, for those that, that want to stay along to the end. Uh, what we'll do today is recap February and March, put that in its sort of uh, winter uh, context. Want to spend a little bit more time talking about snowpack since we're nearing the peak snowpack conditions. Uh, for for the West, we're we're actually already past them for uh, Arizona, and New Mexico, and and kind of coming up on peak snow uh, snowpack in, in in Colorado and Utah. We want to talk a little bit about the streamflow forecasts because uh, this is the time of year where um, they become most accurate, and then a little bit more about the uh, upcoming upcoming seasons with some talk of monsoon, maybe a little talk of monsoon, and um, a little bit of the end so. So how about that, Mike? Sounds great. Yeah, you psyched? I'm psyched. I'm psyched. <laughs> Let me start here, Mike, uh, recapping the last couple of months. So here's the positive. It's not going to be the driest winter on record for many places, for most Yes, places. right. And that, so that's, I think I got a little spring in my step today and talking with you because I was, I was thinking the same thing. So go with this. <laughs> yeah, here's the negative. You ready for the negative? No. It'll likely be a top 10 drive for, for most places in the Southwest. Yeah. I particularly that. Southern Arizona. Right. I looked at uh, some stations around the West and, and, and tried to do the, the sort of winter season. Um, but you know how these go, Mike, sometimes you can't get the, the exact right window. So I could only find one that went back six months. So this, the six months then crops the end of September. So not really, not really the winter, but it didn't rain then anyway. So, right. Right. So the last six months, basically, Tucson uh, Airport is the fifth driest on record. Phoenix, depending on where you are in Phoenix, is the seventh or the third driest driest on record. Near Las Cruces, it's the fifth driest on record. Albuquerque, it's the sixth driest on record. Flagstaff, big winner, is, is, there, is around 35, 35th driest, so sort of in, in the middle of its distribution. But around yeah. there, if you go a little bit... A little bit east to Winslow area, it's, it, it's again, it's the, the sixth driest. Uh, and even farther north around uh, the Grand Canyon, it's, it's the fifth, uh, uh, fourth driest. So, so uh, pretty dry, Mike. Not the driest, but by no means uh, a situation that should have a, a spring to your step. Well, okay, right. I think that we need to kind of <laughs> celebrate that it did rain at all. I'm really concerned about repeat winters. And again, I'm not trying to say it's not bad out there. I'm just saying I was a little bit worried that we were going to do like a 2001, 2002 or a 2017, 2018 kind of situation where it got really, really warm and there was like zero precip. But we've we've had fairly moderate temperatures for the last couple of months and some kind of well-timed, if they're not soakers, but we've had snow events and, you know, some drawn out multiple day rain events, which in a La Nina, I mean, you can't ask for a lot. I feel like the way if we were going to dig this one out was going to be at best, probably what we're seeing right now. 
Well, right. I think that's a good point. You know, the picture that I gave was for the full, full sort of winter season. You know, if you look at the last three months, it's a little bit better. You know, it's still top 10 for most top 10 drives for most places, but uh, it's a little bit of a better picture. And in, in, in part, I think uh, that picture was aided a lot by, for us, at least here in the in Southern Arizona, what was kind of a unexpected storm in in mid-March, Mike. I mean, this was this was a huge storm, actually, uh, regionally. I mean, it's the one that dumped, you know, two to three feet of snow on the front range of Colorado. And, you know, we basically clipped the the southern edges of, 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 of that big event. So, so talk, talk us through that. You paid attention to what was going on in real time, right? Yeah. So like over the last 30 days, and I, I can't remember when we, we podcasted in early February, I think was probably the last time we, we got together and talked about it. And, you know, and in, in across the Southwest, there wasn't a lot to talk about as far as precip, you know, from kind of mid-February up until mid-March. But you know, towards the middle part of March, you know, the round 11th, the 12th, and then, you know, running out for about a week there, we had some storm systems clipping either to the north of us or kind of hitting us proper down here in both Arizona and New Mexico. And so the storm track was still, you know, fairly active, fairly progressive. We didn't have a lot of blocking, you know, we weren't stuck underneath a really strong uh, ridge of of, uh, high pressure for any length of time. And then we ended up having, you know, some pretty deep uh, cold spells and some low pressure systems sort of drop down out of the uh, Pacific Northwest and kind of come right down into the Southwest. And so like you're talking about, Zach, was the one that created the blizzard conditions in Colorado and even parts of sort of Northeast New Mexico um, did end up giving at least the Mogollon Rim, the high country of Arizona, a little bit to, to Southeast Arizona, a pretty good dose of precipitation over a one or two day period. And, and you see those observations kind of picking up mostly in the central and southeast part of the state. And I even saw, um, I saw the second accumulating snow event at our house this winter with that particular event last week. Right. So that was a, that was a pretty cold storm. And if I remember correctly, Mike, it was this closed low that sort of passed over, over us, but then it became sort of a cutoff low which made it persist up uh, as it moved a little bit east and and is what contributed to the really large accumulations of snow in the, what was it, Denver, uh, Fort Collins area, and actually up into up into Wyoming. So they got, like I said, they got like two to three feet of snow, big, big, big storm there. But I think part of the, the accumulations was because of the thing just sort of wandered or, or it was sort of detached from the, the jet stream and and was able to sort of persist for a little bit of a longer period. Yeah, I'm looking at some of the weather maps right now. And it, and it did it did have a, a little bit of a yeah, it certainly was closed. It was still dragged along pretty quickly, though, you know, so because it kind of it moved through the it kind of developed off the West Coast on the 11th. And so by the 12th and the 13th, it was it was moving its way in Lind over the the southwest here, and at that at that point, it didn't have a lot of moisture associated with it. Didn't have a deep subtropical tap. It had some moisture with it. it was cold, so I think that that's really what sparked much of the precipitation we saw here in Arizona. And it wasn't a heavy rainer by any event. It put down some snow at the higher elevations, and some of the lower elevations got you know a bit of precip. But it was as it's mo- as it moved to the east a little bit further, it was able to draw up some Gulf of Mexico moisture, and so that's. That's how you end up getting those those really good heavy snow events on the front range is that you're dap- you're 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 tapping into some deep moisture that's not available to us on this side of the continental divide but it's out kind of it's in the great plains it gets drawn towards the west and can you can even have upslope um, conditions where you're then really enhancing the snowfall and so you got cold air really cold dry air to the north colliding with that really warm air and that's kind of the beginning of the severe storm season too, even in the Great Plains with these kinds of events. Right, exactly. And I think there was like a lot of uh, tornado action or, or risk for tornadoes because of that. And that storm, unfortunately, I guess for sort of the water supply, we'll talk a little bit about this later, but that th- all that snow that fell, uh, you know, did not make it over the Rockies. And so it all fell on sort of the eastern eastern side. Most of it fell on the eastern side, really helped out the the, the water supply there on, on on those rivers, but not sort of the 
the headwaters of the Colorado River. So um, yeah, it's in, it's interesting. You've seen with the the last couple of storms, or the last couple of months, especially February and and the bit of March we're in now through the middle part of the month, that the front range on the other side of the Continental Divide has done better snow wise than sort of the interior basin, the higher elevation mountains there. It's an interesting winter because it's not. It's not the certainly the worst we've ever seen, but it's it's sandwiched with this really bad dry monsoon, dry warm fall, and now it's just kind of a mediocre winter, which is really leaving us in the current drought conditions we have. So you 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 call it a mediocre drought, and let me let me just see if I can't figure out why. Because if you're if you're just looking at the at the precipitation, I mean, I, I would say it's a, a pretty pretty bad. I, I would I would describe it as bad just because. No of the totals. But but I think your point is the timing sort of matters. And if, if I'm looking at just Tucson and trying to f- figure out when the, the, the storms came, I mean, they were kind of equally spaced apart. I mean, it looks like for Tucson, and this is slightly different elsewhere, but there's basically four events so far. Um, there was one early November, then early December, then end of February was sort of the, the, the biggest one. And then the one that we're talking about in, in beginning middle-ish of, of March. So they, they, they were timed in such a way that, um, you know, it, the, the 1.4 inches of rainfall that fell at Tucson, uh, you know, which is what Mike, which is, you know, 40% of average, something like that. Yeah. Did not all happen in two events at the beginning of the season. So is, is that, your argument for why it's not a bad, you know, it's, it's, your point is well taken, right? I mean, you're the way you kicked off the whole podcast was pretty epically bad numbers, right? For all of these stations. And and I completely agree with you. I mean, the stats don't lie in that being in the bottom, you know, 10 percentile or bottom 10 of winters is not good. But I guess that my, <laughs> I think we, the way to communicate this to the listeners is that I expected and I don't know. I mean, the only reason I expected this was that the, you know, our, our canonical La Nina expectations of this sort of moderate strength raises our risk of pretty bad conditions, which is probably what we're seeing. And I was concerned that we would end up having much warmer temperatures than we did mm. all winter. And so they've been a bit more moderate than I think expected. And then the number of snow events was a bit better than I thought we would squeak out. So you know, I think and the timing of them is just what you said, Zach, is that, you know, the fact that we didn't end up having like no events up until now or or any events at all. Like we've seen, you know, there's been a couple of recent La Nina events that I thought were going to be close analogs for this. And, and this this is better than those. Right. I mean, it's the the best of the worst right now in my mind. <laughs> That's that's the title of the pod. The best of the worst. <laughs> you know, and just and just having this like this most recent precip event again, it does not. We are in no way like getting precip fast enough to dig out the deficits that are accumulating right now. You're right. You just look at all these maps, but you know, as far as like stretching things out for fire danger, like this buys us just a tiny little bit of time putting down this moisture across the southwest to just just kind of stave off you know, the conditions getting much, much worse. And and like you said, Flagstaff, you know, j- very localized, had done pretty well with getting some of this heavier precip. There are some other parts of the state that are just not hanging in there at all. And like I said, too, is like the the summer monsoon drought conditions that put us into deep drought, and then the fall kind of not having much, and then these mediocre really leave us in a still very dire, very novel situation in the contemporary record, right? With having bad summer and then not a great winter, but I felt like it could could have been a lot worse. Well, that's good. I mean, you know, we also had the last two years, uh, 2020 and, and 2019 were decent precipitation winters for the Tucson area. Actually, probably, let me see if I can't find Phoenix as well. Yeah, Phoenix too. I mean, but, but both of them had uh, above average rainfall in, in 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 the in the past two winters. So, as far as long term drought here, it's a, such a mess of intense short term droughts and then subtle reco- potentially short term recoveries, right? Of having a, wet, a good season here, a good season there, and and like right now, I feel like the summer the impacts 
that we felt from the summer monsoon, we won't really know if they've been resolved until we get through this winter and next summer, right? If we get, if we actually have a decent monsoon, then we can see if, you know, I'm thinking of like the timing of precip and the plants and the other ecosystems that needed that timing of precip. It, it comes online and it's the same with the winter type drought right here. It's like takes a little while for us to see if we're really in a bad spot. I think that the thing that we do know is bad is that soil moisture is badly, badly depleted because we missed the summer, missed the fall. And now we're getting snow, which is good, but it's all it's doing is it's going into recharging a badly depleted soil moisture reserve, which means that we're going to see water resources impacts linger for, you know, for quite a while. Right. We'll, we'll, we'll move into the snowpack and the water resources in, in, in a minute, but I wanted to just uh, talk a little bit about your thoughts on how much this resembled a La Nina year. Uh, you sort of mentioned it um, and it's a sort of canonical La Nina is that it takes off. And we talked about this last, last month, it takes off a few, a few storms during, during the winter. And that certainly seems to have, ha- have been the case this winter. I mean, we still have uh, maybe what Mike, we, we could squeak out another storm or two at the, at the most. I mean, if, if you remember 2019, we had, I think what, uh, Hail Mary in May that was really helpful. Uh, I, I, obviously, we can't <laughs> can't expect that, but um, but I guess there's two questions in there. So one of them is how much did this look like a La Nina, and how much was the sort of atmosphere uh, itself looking like a La Nina? And then what do you think going forward? Uh, how much how much faith do you have that uh, this picture may change? It's so instructive and humbling, you know, as we try to like use our use these seasonal forecasts and when we get into winters where you know and this is we've talked about this for years for a decade now on this podcast but you know the seasonal climate outlooks really only have useful skill on the precip side for the southwest when we get into el nino and la nina events right so when we get into the summer and we start to have an an enso event of either you know a decent el nino or a decent la nina we start to kind of get excited because we feel like there's some possibility that we can anticipate what will happen the next winter. So the La Nina forming in the summer gave us some confidence that we would expect drier than average conditions for this winter. So I think largely that has panned out correctly. And if you look at the weather patterns over the winter time, you see some definite broader impacts of La Nina. And, you know, reading a lot of the discussions by the Climate Prediction Center, there was good emergent impacts in the tropics with La Nina early on in the season and the atmosphere responded. And so we saw a shift in the walker circulation, which we talked about before, but it was cool because I was reading the ENSO blog, the the climate.gov ENSO blog, which you and I've talked about. And it's really, I think a great resource for everybody to check back, but I was kind of going back through them. There was a blog written last month about was La Nina evident in the circulation patterns? And it was, they were basically saying that the canonical, you know, the typical La Nina pattern that you'd see among the strongest La Nina events really wasn't there this winter. And I I was kind of taken aback from that. And if you look at a little more closely, I think that you typically see a ridge of high pressure across the Pacific Ocean. And we did see that. And what you end up seeing on the other side of the ridge is a trough, which puts us into those kind of cool, dry systems that we've seen all winter long. So I think we've seen that. But what they're they're pointing out was that there was a deep, low pressure system over Alaska and it extended back into Siberia, which was not typical. And nobody's really sure why. So it was kind of this, like La Nina showed up in the tropics, started to exert its muscle on the Northern Hemisphere. But the weather variability of the Northern Hemisphere had other ideas. Something else was going on. They were kind of muscled back on it. But largely, I think for the Southwest, we did end up seeing the the impact that we you would have expected to see with a La Nina. I don't think it's by mistake that we ended up drier than average and there was a La Nina. I think that they were related to each other. Well, right. And I think the one thing that I've gleaned from looking at like all of the ENSO events uh, individually is that no, when you aggregate them, there's these these patterns that that on average show up, but they're all quite different. And this one, like you said, has an expression of that ridge in the, um, in the, in the Pacific. Um, and that 
posit that low lower pressure area that is typically over sort of British Columbia, if you will, w- was shifted further to the west, and and maybe there was something going on. I mean, there was a there was a big sort of polar vortex, if you will. Uh, Arctic Oscillation was doing some things. I know that that's sort of like a topic of debate of just by how much the Arctic conditions are uh, affecting or interacting with the, the the sort of the tropical conditions, the ENSO conditions, but maybe that had something to play uh, as, as well. Yeah, totally agree. And I think that that's, you know, it's the postmortems on every winter, you know, it's like using the sudden stratospheric warmings, like the disruption of the polar vortex, how much did that come into play? And then a La Nina phase or ENSO phase and La Nina, and then the Mandulian oscillation, none of them are operating independent of each other. And they're all sort of they're right. they're correlated with each other. So I think that it'll be interesting to see what the postmortem, you know, research really starts to look at this winter. And I just, you know, everything that I've read is like, it's not super clear what's the most prominent feature here. I think, you know, La Nina, I think for us anyways, it, it was at play. And I think it led to a, a fairly reasonable prediction for us. And we ended up below average. And I'm, t- I'm just glad you know, we had a handful of precip events across the Southwest, even up to this day, you know, getting one in March. You know, your baseline has been reset. That's all I'm going to say before moving. <laughs> Do you wait, am I optimistic or pessimistic? Oh, well, I think it's like, you know, you've, you, your, your expectation has been tamped down such that oh. like, even a few storms that drop a little bit of snow at your house, like <laughs> it makes you. It's possible. I'm totally locally skewed here because I haven't left the house in a year. Like <laughs> it, it's possible that I don't have any context for broader, broader uh, variability. But and, yeah, and again, I just want to reiterate, I'm not saying like this wasn't a terrible winter as far as precip right. because it really was. But the timing and the spacing of it and the fact that we haven't kind of looking forward, right, is Ben was pointing this out that a lot of the broader ENSO discussions right now are showing that La Nina is waning quickly. And the atmosphere is starting to kind of notice, but we expect that the La Nina impacts of the atmospheric circulation, they linger at least for a month or two, even after La Nina goes away. So that's going to put us well into our dry spring so that our our short-term outlooks, even out for the next couple of weeks out to the next couple of months. Yeah, maybe we get another precip event. It's not going to be a soaker, it looks like. Maybe it puts down a little bit more of this, these really small events, like you're pointing out, it's not much. Um, and then that's probably it for the rest of the season. And we got to get through the rest of this spring without epic wildfires, which I'm you know, really concerned about. And then the water situation is is in bad spot. It'll be interesting to see the the to, to watch closely the, the the temperature ramp up, because I think obviously we don't get any rain, you know, for the most part in May and certainly not in June unless we're super lucky. But if we have like an early like heat season, that's going to be a bad a bad situation. So yeah, yeah. like the, the early, well, just like last point, the early, the early heat season. And one thing I'm concerned about is a lot of variability is like, if we were going into like dry heat, cold wind, dry heat, cold wind, the fire situation just gets really bad. You know, it's almost like, it's almost better to get into dry heat without a lot of wind, <laughs> you know, well, that's a different kind of fire situation than the wind. It kind of brings up a question about if this La Nina sort of lingers, like w- would that maybe make the the the, the jet stream a little bit less, uh, a little bit more var- variable and such that we might actually get sort of a cold system moving in that maybe doesn't have any any moisture associated with it, but does bring the high high winds. Would the 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 lingering La Nina maybe disrupt the 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 sort of typical progression of the jet stream? Yeah, no, it's a great point. And it's been on my mind because there aren't really perfect analogs. Every year is just a little bit different. 2011, which was a moderate strong La Nina, very poor precip situation with that uh, winter time. But then it turned into a, a deep trough, a cold trough of uh, low pressure kind of parked off of the West Coast. And th- that was the spring of the really high wind fire events that we had the Wallow Fire and the Horseshoe 2. And so the ones that burned up, just giant. I mean, they were the ones that were wind-driven storms and also the ones in New Mexico. So it's interesting on the pattern correlation, this particular winter's jet stream pattern hasn't looked anything like 2011, 2012, right? Just just like the pattern across the Pacific. The 2011, 
20, 2011 in particular, 2012, La Nina was more related to the more typical La Nina event as opposed to this one. So maybe that's a little bit of hope that we don't follow suit with the 2011. I do, you know, those passing storm systems and the the wind is pretty typical for the Southwest. It's just a matter of the frequency now and how deep they are and, and you know, how much heat we get in between them, I guess. And we talked a little bit about the sort of atmospheric pattern of, of La Nina, but when you also look at the the precipitation or the snowpack rather pattern, it looks pretty classic La Nina. That is to say, pretty dry, below average, the further south you get and, you know, the Pacific Northwest is above average. And that's, and that's what plays out. I, Arizona, sort of the salt, the upper Gila, uh, the Rio Grande in New Mexico, the little Colorado River, like those are some of the, they, they're the basins with the, the, the fewest amount of current snow water uh, equivalent. So that's as of March 17th. And basically it's sort of a below average picture until you get, boy, you basically have to go up into Idaho and 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 Wyoming and Montana um, for the the situation to change. With the exception of what we talked about before, sort of in, on the eastern side of the, the the Rocky Mountains in the sort of North Platte, South Platte, and in Arkansas river basins, where that that snowstorm that we talked about before really really pushed up snow water equivalent uh, snowpacks to to close to average, if not a little bit above. So yeah, they're looking pretty good. And just like you said, you go. You go on the other side of the divide towards us and it just falls off really quickly. We actually had some cold storms that brought snowpack to low elevations, 3,000 feet or so. Uh, that, that, that most recent one, I think, was around that elevation in, in March, around March 12th. The snowpack conditions, though, uh, across the Arizona and New Mexico are pretty, are pretty bleak as of right now. So just looking at the Snowtel reports, so these are, these are stations that are, are principally located to monitor high elevation uh, rainfall and snow, snowfall uh, in the in the Salt River uh, as of the as of March one, uh, the Salt River has uh, uh, had thirty four percent of average, whereas the Verde had about sixteen percent of average. So th- those are a point in time, and if you look at sort of the accumulated precip, which is, uh, I think, maybe a better measure when we think about stream flow. When you look at accumulated precip in those basins, uh, it was slightly better. So 46% of average uh, in the salt and 49% of average in the Verde. So so currently the upper Gila has about 75% of average, or not currently, but as of March March 1st. But over the entire water year, the, the winter uh, rainfall, accumulated rainfall and snowfall is about 50%. So those situations don't bode well for uh, stream flow, which we can talk about in a minute. Yeah, I, I just wanted to point out too, we've been talking about this in, in February, we saw this and now still there is there's like a tail of two parts of Arizona too, you know, like the far eastern high elevations at the kind of upper reaches of the the salt, like Mount Baldy, that I can't believe how bad the snowpack has been there this winter. And then if you go over to Flagstaff, the Flagstaff had a couple of storms and they they caught right up. I mean, and those, that's just not that far away from each other. Right. You know, these storms have been so selective in the way that they've been, you know, clobbering one spot and then totally leaving someplace that's just not that far away alone. Yeah, it's it just speaks to that, basically the the position and trajectory of the uh, of those systems that come in, the jet stream more or less. We have not had any big soaker, heavy rain. And even when we have had big events in Arizona this winter, they've been very isolated in, you know, who they've they've clobbered. And, you know, clobbered is such a an over, that's just the wrong term for this winter. Yeah, you know? no. <laughs> in a very low bar that's winter. Your, that's like, your resetted, your your reset baselines. I know. And it's probably confusing to people because it's it's just such a low bar for a La Nina winter. And I just, it's like if you were in track and did the, what is it? The high the jump? hurdles or the high. Yes. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yours it's is just wobbling first, on the, <laughs> yours is the first rung. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. <laughs> right. It's the training one right there. <laughs> Those snowpack conditions by no stretch of the imagination are paint a good picture. It's even worse for, it's even worse for the stream flow. So and I think the point is this, it's like, 
an average snowpack, you know, doesn't necessarily mean an average stream flow. Yeah, yeah. So let me read off some numbers and then we can talk a little bit about this. The stream flow forecast for the Rio Grande, uh, which is basically at the border of Colorado, New Mexico. So the upper headwaters of the Rio Grande, the stream flow forecast is 70% of average. And that stream flow forecast would be for uh, the accumulated water that flows through this point up until um, forgetting the, it's either April 1 or, or, or March 15th or, or somewhere, it's got a specific date. So it's 70% of average. Well, currently the, the basin headwaters have 84% of average. So higher snowpack or accumulated precipitation and lower stream flow. And that's the case for the Gila. So the Gila near, near Coolidge, which is just below Lake Roosevelt, the stream flow forecast is 19% of average yet the basin has experienced about 50% of accumulated precipitation up until this point. Salt, 19% stream flow forecast. Uh, accumulated water year precipitation, 46% of average. Verde near Horseshoe Dam, 28% for the stream flow forecast. Uh, uh, basin wide accumulated precipitation, 49%. So to me, I'm like, we need even to have the stream flows and we should talk a little bit more about this going forward, Mike, because this might be one of the bigger stories that starts emerging. Uh, in fact, I've already seen a bunch of uh, news articles uh, about the water situation, but this is going to be a, 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 a recurring narrative about the water situation uh, go, going forward, at least until the month, well, probably at least until next winter. Um, but the point I want to make here is that we need in the Southwest to have much above average snowfall to have average, if, if you will, or near average stream flow. So, you yeah, know, just to build on that point, too, and, you know, some of the research we've seen from some of our colleagues recently, and, and especially over the last decade, but even more recently, is that the fall and even the summer precipitation to sort of condition the soil moisture to then have the ability of the snowpack to actually not just go into melting and replenishing the soil moisture, but to actually run off is important. So, we had this problem last year where the monsoon of 2019 was bad. We ended up having a fairly decent November precipitation and even through the early part of last winter. So 2019, 2020, and the streamflow forecasts were still quite miserable, right? And so that was part of that was picking up on the dry 2019 summer monsoon signal. So here we are even worse in 2020 monsoon dry fall now bad you know poor precipitation on top of this it's even harder now to generate any of this this uh, stream flow which is exactly what you're kind of picking up on these numbers there's a lot of nuance between these basins like you were saying um before we got on here that the verde you know in comparison let's say the lower colorado river or the upper rio grande obviously you know or even perhaps the salt generates more of its stream flow from the mon relatively more of its stream flow from the mon monsoon than 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 other basins. So there's there is nuance to these these different basins that's that's quite interesting as well. The hydrology of it is is is, is quite different. Yeah, and there's there was a paper out this last summer too that that showed that even some of the upper basins in the Colorado like the upper Colorado some of those mountain watersheds, the subwatersheds they had done some studies on showed that the summer precip was even important for subsequent seasonal uh, runoff in following springs, you know, after snowpack had melted and was turning into runoff. So it's like this, this interseasonal issue becomes, we're, we're getting a sense that you get this sort of continuation of the season sort of stacking up on each other. And these, these impacts can accumulate and impact stream flow many seasons later. Right. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention what the stream flow forecast is uh, for the Colorado River, uh, which is currently like sort of the best estimate. So th these stream flow forecasts are done in like these probability of exceedances. Um, and so you can kind of pick the probability of exceedance, 10, 30, 50, 70. I always grab the 50% the exceedance, which basically means you have a 50% chance of being higher than the number or a 50% chance lower than the number. So I always think of it as sort of the best, the best estimate or the median estimate. And so for the Colorado River, it's, it's about 50% uh, <laughs> There's a 50% chance that the, the 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 flow into Colorado will be above 50% or below 50% of average. How about that one? That's 
I'm going to need you to record like a YouTube video to explain all this to me again yeah. so I can just watch it over and over again. But I, I think I generally get it. So, okay, so say that again for the Colorado River. Okay, so for the Colorado River, right, so the, the stream flow forecast that I'm giving is for the 50% exceedance probability. So that means that there is a 50% chance it could be over a, the value that I stake or a 50% chance that it could be below the value that I stake, right? Okay. So it kind of gives you a flip of the coin, like it could be better or it could be worse, but it's it's a good gauge, I think, to, it's a midpoint of what yeah. the flows could be. Okay, so it's basically so saying there's a, there's a decent chance that it's going to be very low, right? I mean, that's-, that's Yes. The, okay. Right. And, and, and with this particular forecast, because the forecast is 50%, there's a 50% chance that it could be less than 50% of average. So that's not very good. <laughs> you know, and as you go, not very good. But but to give you an illustration, as you go up in the forecasted amount, the the, the probability of exceeding that goes down. Okay, so if that makes sense. Yeah. So let me just make another point. Like, if it were a a wet year and we've had a lot of snow and a lot of rainfall thus far, there could be a fifty percent chance that the stream flow would be greater than one hundred and fifty percent of average. So, yeah. So I think this is interesting because these I like these stream flow forecasts because what they do is is they they actually get more accurate as you get closer to April 1, and that's because they're incorporating everything that came before and then making projections on the future. So, you know, if if you know you're just a week left in before uh, a week before April 1, basically, you know, nearly all of the winter rainfall has already fallen and it makes it really accurate to say, well, what's going to happen in the next week and, and make a, a, a projection after that. So these, these forecasts are incorporating historical, what actually occurred. And then based on the historical record, what are possibilities, which is why you get sort of a probability forecast. I think you've explained this to me six times. I mean, it makes perfect sense once you kind of talk, talk through it. Yeah. And the reason they do it is because I mean, in a way, it's trying to be these bespoke uh, um, information services. Like, like the people that are making these these forecasts, like they don't actually know what users really want. Like, some users may want like, what's the worst case scenario, and consequently, they pick a different exceedance value versus uh, versus a different user. So it allow it's a little bit more flexible than just saying, hey, we're just going to use the median and, and tell you there's a uh, twenty five percent chance it'll be above average, or seventy five percent chance it'll be below average. So yeah, yeah. Uh, and, but it, it it does burden the user. But hey, that's that's why we're here, right? We're here to help to try to make sense of this. I still feel burdened, though. <laughs> well, there's there's room for improvement. But, no, it's it's so, uh, there's room for improvement uh, in me personally. All right, just very quickly, we got we got a lot more training to cover. I just wanted to go over the reservoir sort of situation and 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 we'll spend mike maybe we can spend a little bit more time on this in our upcoming uh episodes yeah i'd uh, like i'd like to do that i'd like to talk about this a little bit more so i can get my head around a little more i tried to reacquaint myself with how lakes pal and, and lakes mead are 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 managed because you can't just look at the colorado river you have to look at the colorado river management in its totality and not just like one particular part because Flow from Lake Powell is released in relation to its water level, but also the water level in Lake Mead and, and so on and so forth. But, and, and, and consequently, like every single year, I'm always sort of waiting for the shortage to kick in. And it seems like we're getting closer, but not there. We did this podcast series like seven years ago, maybe even maybe six years ago about the Colorado River shortage and and the title was like 1075, which is still worth listening to. I think it's still on the Clemus webpage. Um, but it was basically we started it because we thought within the next couple of years the Colorado was going to go into um, sort of shortage declaration, uh, which would kick in a bunch of uh, of other management um, um, scenarios, and they and that hasn't happened yet. So anyway, the the point is is uh, water management. I think in it, reservoir management is particularly complicated here in, in the West. But let me just go over a couple of numbers. Lakes Mead and Lake, Lake, Lake Powell uh, have uh, 38% respectively. The Verde River system is 29% full. The Salt River system is 83% full. And the San Carlos system is only 
uh, fold. So maybe we can spend a little bit of time talking about that. And then the, the one that I want to mention uh, in the in New Mexico is you know the major river there is 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 the Rio Grande, Elephant Butte, which is which supplies water to Las Cruces and goes on uh, into Texas, and also the irrigation district there is only eight percent, and it's been like that for for a long time. The San Carlos is interesting, Mike, because two percent sort of stuck out uh, like it was. Uh, I haven't looked at these numbers in a long time, so I wanted to dig in a little bit with that. Any thoughts on San Carlos though before I, I give you what I've what I've looked into? So the same, so the first thing, two percent is that is that low for this time of year, relatively it's to it's <laughs> number, <laughs> relatively to past seasons, right? I mean, it could be always two percent. So I just looked at the last five years, and it is low, but it's also been low before. So in 2020, March of 2020, it was 14 percent. The year before that, 8%, March 2018, 7%, March 2017, 26%, and, and 2016 was 12%. So 2% now is lower than it's been in the last five years. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is if you look at the pattern of the San Carlos Reservoir storage, you've got this, I mean, this is kind of obvious, but it fills up during the winter. And But it, but what's not obvious, it, it, it dips down to near empty always, at least over the last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years, eight years rather, to virtually virtually nothing, not virtually nothing, to, to just a little bit. Um, so it's got that pattern. I think now, now we're in a little bit of a, of, a, of, a, of a worse situation than we've been in the past, in part, Mike, because it certainly the dry monsoon and this dry winter is, 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 is part of that, but th this is a reservoir that seems to be persistently uh, near near empty at some point during during the year. Yeah, I didn't. That was really helpful that you uh, pulled all that data together because I hadn't. I did not know it kind of filled up and and went down so sort of periodically. One other bit of information I think is is interesting. I looked at the discharge that goes in that from the Gila River that goes into the reservoir. It's not the only contributing river, but it's the the it's like 80% or 85% of the total discharge that goes into the, the, the river. And the USGS had data uh, since 1930. So I got some good averages here. So the historical average is close to 260,000 acre feet per year. The most recent decade was the lowest in the last 40 years. So I, only, I only went back to the 1981, 1990 decade, but the last 10 years have been the lowest. So the 2011, 2020 average was 170,000 acre feet. And then the decade before that was 225. And the decade before that was 520,000 acre feet. So the, the change in the, in the climate, whether naturally varying or, you know, some part of climate signal there, uh, climate change signal there is part of this story too. I think it's got some fairly complex management where there's releases for irrigation. And I mean, I don't, I don't know enough about it. <laughs> I'm on the Wikipedia page though. You, you actually probably did uh, really good reputable sources and I went right to the Wikipedia page, but the uh, Wikipedia well, page says it's been nearly empty at least 20 times since its construction and full only three times. Yeah, there you go. Well, I felt like a dilettante too, like g getting into the water story because it is, it is very complicated, and I always feel like I'm, uh, I, I don't have the full picture or even close part of the picture in, in mind. So we'll, we'll, we'll spend a little bit more time in, in, in coming episodes trying to understand this water situation going forward. Mike, all right. So in the last five minutes, let's turn to what may be on tap going forward. And I want to preface this by saying, since we're only 89 days or 88 days or whatever it is to the monsoon, I, I did look out to, uh, I did look at the CPC's two and a half month lead wishful thinking forecasts uh, to look at the July, August, September period. And lo and behold, there's increased odds of wetter monsoon season. What do you think of that? I just refreshed the page and as you're talking, see this above average lean for July, August, September, 
for the for Arizona and parts of New Mexico, I say bold move, CPC. <laughs> bold move. <laughs> totally bold move. So is it worth it all trying to figure out what are they picking up on? I mean, these are dynamical models, so I'm not even sure they know, right? Well, we could read the discussion or we could just muse about what the discussion says. I don't think there's much in there. Is about- there? I'm looking, I'm looking at it right now. <laughs> Whenever I read those discussions, I, I'm I'm always wanting like more of the why instead of the what. Okay, here it is. Below normal soil moisture and snowpack in the Southwest, Southern Rockies may allow for more efficient heating of the landmass. And so potentially an enhanced monsoon circulation earlier, all factors being equal. Along these lines, elevated odds for above normal precipitation is favored for parts of the Southwest from June, July, August through August, September, October, 2021. Well, nice. That's more of the why than you usually get. I, I, I appreciate that CPC. Yeah. It, and it says some dynamical model guidance also supports this forecast. This is really interesting. And we're going to have to dig into this because this is the, this is the dry winter, wet summer analog. Right. right. Or correlation. So that's that's interesting on a couple fronts, right? The 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 qualification of some dynamical models, right? That also means that some aren't. And and it also to me means that there would they be would the forecasters be imparting their sort of sub not subjective, but you know, it's based on these relationships that are that are found, but maybe not showing up in the dynamical models. You you think I, I can't remember how these are actually are actually done. The forecasts? No, this is this was this will be the forecasters, you know, privilege to be able to kind of put that in there. Right. You know, there's going to be a discussion. They're going to have a they're going to have a monthly discussion. They're going to talk about it and they're going to lean on that as an idea. You know, and this is, you know, not not super well borne out in the research that this is a a particularly useful forecast. I mean, or 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 tool to use as a forecast, especially this early. Hence um, the bold. It is bold. I mean, it's so far out and we will have to continue to check on this. It'll be interesting to see, you know, if they hold on to this too uh, going forward. So I don't know. I'm not, I'm not really ready to, to bank on this, <laughs> this particular one. We're, we're coming out of a La Nina too. So there's, there's a little bit of the, the La Nina hangover, which, could be showing up in the dynamical models, which would be, I mean, that's kind of Chris Castro's work that shows that you can end up having some of that La Nina influence in the early onset of the monsoon. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it's it's going to be weak because the La Nina will have been have faded pretty strongly by that point. So you really will be relying on this, this sensible heating of the landmass signal going forward, which could, go, which could really change a lot in the next couple of months. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the shorter term forecasts, you know, 10 to 14 days, the three week forecast, the one month forecast, they're not, they're not throwing us a bone. So it doesn't look like at least from the, from those guidance that, uh, there is anything on the near horizon uh, for us. No, I'm a little more, you know, it's like April, May and June are going to be tough months with the fire risk. So that's, that's really grabbing my attention more than even the kind of the monsoon onset at this point, talking about the water situation and talking about the, and keeping an eye on the fire situation are going to, I think, take up our attention for the next couple of months. And then, you know, as we get into June, I feel like we'll have a little bit better idea of this kind of early onset is, uh, is even in play. Well, Hey, I wanted to drop one plug to our listeners who have stayed on this long. But um, for those who participated last year, we did this monsoon forecasting game uh, where people would, ahead of the particular month, they would estimate what the total precipitation would be at, at the five major cities uh, or, or the five cities here in the Southwest. Uh, and we're going to do that game again this, this year. And uh, we're going to have a cool, hopefully we'll get our act together and have a cool website. So it'll be a little bit more uh, formal and, and, and interactive, but I'm going to drop a plug there. And Mike, we're going to, we'll, we'll continue to drop plugs because we, we think this is a really fun way to engage people who, a lot of people in the Southwest who really turn their attention to, who love the monsoon and get a, you know, follow it kind of like people follow sports. Uh, and so we'll, we'll try to feed that curiosity and, 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 and interest with the, with the cool forecasting game. 
yes, I'm excited about that. And it'll be um, kind of a fun way to plug into the season. All right, Mikey, any parting shots? No, I think let's just hang in there and, you know, keep the monsoon clock ticking down. All right, we're, we're getting there. Uh, thanks, everybody. Have a great uh, have a great rest of your month. Take care, everyone. I think I told you that I looked up and Will Rogers once said if it was if it was my dam, I'd mow it. That might be apocryphal, <laughs> but it was on the Wikipedia page. But by the time we do this next time, we'll be in the the, the 50s or, or the 60s in terms of days remaining. That's right. The monsoon clock. We'll get that up on the Clemens website. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, Ben. <laughs> All right.